So welcome everyone. Good morning and thanks for joining us today for our core coffee chat where we'll help answer some questions about the upcoming COVID vaccines for kids in the five to 11 year old age range. And we're so happy to be joined today by some guests who work directly with children and parents on a daily basis. And they've been thinking a lot and doing a lot of work on COVID vaccines for every age group, but especially younger ones. And I'm Nicole Young, and I'm one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or Core Investments. And this is a collective impact approach to achieving equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. And our core events are held bilingually in English with Spanish interpretation, and we're able to do that thanks to our team members, Stella Lauerman, who's providing interpretation today, and Gisela Carrasco, who also helps with interpretation and translating comments and questions in the chat. Okay, let me do a quick overview of what CORE is for any of you who are new uh, to these CORE sessions today. So again, CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments, and it's both a funding model and a broader movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County. And we really uh, practice using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. And over you know, the last few years, with input from many, many people, we've developed this mission and vision statement for CORE with equity always at the center. And when we say equitable health and well-being, we mean that, again, all people across the lifespan have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interconnected core conditions for health and well-being, uh, and that people's opportunities and their life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse um, by things like race, ethnicity, income, gender, sexual orientation, immigration status, uh, zip code or other aspects of social identities. And equity is always at the center of this diagram to remind us that we have to examine and address our individual and organizational and systemic beliefs and practices and structures that might very often be perpetuating the very inequities that we're determined to eliminate. So it's just that constant reminder for us. Um, and in our county and across the country, we know that the COVID pandemic has um, shown how the burdens of an economic and health threat are not borne equally uh, for everyone. Uh, it's also reminded us and really shown us how interconnected all these core conditions are. So whether it's the essential workers who faced increased risk of exposure to COVID because they weren't able to work from home in the way that many of us could, um, or the overcrowded housing conditions that increase the risk of transmission of COVID, um, or the increased risk of hospitalization and death due to untreated underlying conditions, um, or unequal access to broadband and Wi-Fi that affected remote learning access, um, or even, and this is a new statistic I just learned, even the toll on the 140,000 children across the country who have now lost a primary caregiver to COVID. Um, and 65% of those were children of color. You know, all of that just serves as this you know, constant and stark reminder of how a lack of equity and racial equity in particular really ripples throughout our health, education, justice, economic, and other systems. And so we try to highlight and bring attention to these kinds of issues through events like this CORE Coffee Chat, which we offer as part of the CORE Institute for Innovation and Impact. Uh, and just think of the CORE Institute as kind of a container or an umbrella that holds an array of training, technical assistance, and other learning opportunities for people in nonprofits, public agencies, grassroots groups. Uh, we're starting to see more people from the business community. Uh, and our goal really is to build knowledge and skills and systems that are needed to fulfill our collective vision of an equitable, thriving, and resilient community. So we're so happy that all of you are here today. And um, again, so thrilled and um, honored to have our this powerful panel of guests with us today that are experts uh, in health and education. They have a lot of information and uh, some answers to share with us today. Um, I do want to say, you know, we we 
I don't think we know exactly when the FDA will grant emergency use authorization or EUA for the COVID vaccine for the uh, five to 11 year olds, but we hear it, it should be coming soon and sometime in the next couple of weeks, it's looking like early November. Um, and so we you know, know that a lot of parent, parents and guardians and um, other caring adults have had a lot of questions, even if they're, they're already vaccinated, there are you know, questions about what does this mean? You know, when is it coming? What, I, what do I need to know and, and expect? And so we wanted to have this opportunity to share some of that information and get some of these questions answered sooner rather than later. And so we're really fortunate to have, um, again, these guests with us today who've been thinking about the COVID vaccine um, and how to make it accessible and equitable uh, as early as possible in our county. And so first we're gonna start off with a brief overview from Erica Padilla Chavez, who's the CEO of Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance or PVPSA. And she's gonna share some of the work that PVPSA does as well as some survey results that um, give us some insights about what families and individuals are thinking about, the kinds of concerns or questions they have about the vaccine. Um, and then Erica will also uh, take some of the themes and ask some questions of our other guests. And so for issues related to schools and kids and vaccines, uh, we have Jennifer Busing, the Director of School Safety at the County Office of Education, who's here to help answer those questions. Um, Dr. Farah Sabah, the County Superintendent of Schools, was originally scheduled to join us today, but had a last minute change in, in his schedule and unfortunately is unable to be here today. But uh, Jennifer has a wealth of information that she can share with us today. Uh, we also have pediatricians and a pediatric nurse practitioner here today to answer a lot of those kind of clinical types of questions about the vaccine. Um, so Erica will also help kind of moderate the discussion and, and questions. So we have Dr. Devin Francis, the director of pediatrics and a pediatrician from Salud para la Gente. And Dr. Francis can only stay with us today until 1030, so we'll make sure she has a chance to help answer any questions that, uh, that she can before she has to go. We're also joined by Dr. Carmen Powell, a pediatric hospitalist from Watsonville Community Hospital, and Dr. Satu Larson, a pediatric nurse practitioner and complex care manager from Santa Cruz Community Health Centers. Okay. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Erica next. And Erica, I'll bring your, I'll actually bring your slides back up to get us started. Well, good morning, buenos dias. Um, thank you so much for creating the space uh, for us to enter into uh, a conversation that many of us have been having for many, many months. I'd like to just briefly um, inform um, those uh, in attendance and who will be viewing this uh, about the work that PVPSA in partnership with so many other organizations in the Pajaro Valley have been engaged in for over, what is it now, 17 months. Um, so at the height of the uh, pandemic, we recognized that in the Pajaro Valley, we needed to have a place-based approach for engaging the community um, with uh, the understanding of public health education around COVID-19. And over the last 17 months, we have been doing just that, engaging the community in multiple ways. Um, we have community health workers. We've got, of course, our different organizations who deploy staff into the community on a regular basis. And one of the committees that we spearhead, have been spearheading um, as a collective has been the PB Safe Lives. Many of you have been have heard about the Pajaro Valley Safe Lives Group. And we are responsible for doing all the public health education, both in English, Spanish, and Mixteco um, for in the Pajaro Valley, which then gets used uh, throughout the Central Coast, which is wonderful. Recently, our committee wanted to um, hear directly from the community. Why is it, uh, or the top three reasons that some people have yet to receive their COVID vaccine? And so we did this both in English and Spanish, and we used different social media platforms to collect raw data. We really just wanted to hear directly from the community. And here's what they said. Next slide, Nicole. So these are some of the comments that were made and um, maybe not so uh, new to, to us, but 
The idea that the vaccine was produced too quickly continues to be a, a, a concern, um, afraid of side effects, uh, a lack of trust with government or that government should not be telling individuals what to do. Um, this belief that the vaccine will impact a person's ability, a woman's ability to have children in the future for religious reasons. Generational trauma was a point that was made by the community, meaning that we know that there, in our history, there has been uh, moments where, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, attempts to vaccinate have led to disproportionate impact and death, particularly among people of color. People are too busy that the day-to-day -day life just gets in the way of folks being able to get to the vaccine site. This idea that if you've had COVID, you don't need the vaccine anymore. Next slide, Nicole. That it hasn't been tested long enough. We really don't know the side effects or the long-term effects. There's a belief in the community that people are not getting vaccinated because of ignorance or selfishness. A lot of comments about the misinformation that is out circulating in social media. They cited politics as being a reason why people have not yet received their vaccine. This fear of needles, um, a real fear that we know exists. I have loved ones who very much are fearful of needles. This reliance on our own immune system, if we're healthy, we don't need the vaccine. That it doesn't protect against the new variants and that it's not the law. So these are comments um, that were made directly from the community, community members, friends, neighbors. And so for today's conversation, I wanna begin by engaging our medical um, practitioners who are with us today, uh, Dr. Francis, Dr. Powell, Dr. Larson. What can you tell us about the, the first point that was made here in these slides? This idea that this emergency use authorization uh, is really um, was done too quickly and that the vaccine is therefore unsafe. Who would like to weigh in on that? I can start. Go ahead. You know, before I go, I will answer that question. I want to also just kind of frame this piece about thinking about five to 11 year olds. Um, this is really the next group that's getting vaccinated. And I think one quick point to, to recognize, you know, as pediatrician, I'm always thinking about, you know, a child's development and, and where they are in that spectrum from you know, newborn to adult. And one piece about the five to 11 year olds is more than any other age group, this is a group that's gonna be really looking to their adult or parent, caregiver, teachers, et cetera, um, to how they're gonna be experiencing you know, the pandemic in general, but, you know, particularly the vaccine, um, you know, the teenagers have, you know, they're more looking to peers, teachers, they have different places where they might be getting information and kind of formulating their own opinions. The under fives are not going to really understand the concepts of, you know, vaccines and things like that. So the five to 11 year olds, they're really developing this ability to think and understand and pay attention. And so they will one, pick up on our emotions and our behaviors and our words. And so, you know, as the adults, if we are, you know, fearful, skeptical, um, you know, sharing misinformation, you know, that really impacts that group um, as a whole. Instead, if we are, you know, confident or, you know, relieved or, you know, asking questions, um, you know, the kids will pick up on that as well. So I think this, really glad to see that you are all here today. It's so important for all of us to uh, be informed and then just to make sure that, you know, our kids are really watching us, particularly at this age group. Um, so in terms of thinking about, you know, how quickly the vaccine came out, I think there's a couple of points to know. Um, one has to do with this process of emergency use authorization. Uh, it's it's really a mechanism designed to get treatments out for something that's life-threatening, like in a global pandemic. How do we get a treatment out quickly um, using the best available evidence that we have? To sort of the layperson and 
even to myself as a physician, before I really, you know, dove into how this works, you know, there's a concern to think, oh, well, does that mean that there's shortcuts on the on the safety um, or the science piece? And there's really not the same process of clinical trials still follows. We have to go through, you know, phase one, two, three, you know, before you can um, apply for anything to be approved. And all of those scientific trials still happened um, in tens of thousands of patients. And then all of the safety monitoring after vaccines, um, after people have received the vaccines, both in the study population and in the general population, all of those safety pieces are still there. And the data, um, you know, it's reviewed in the FDA, FDA by scientists and physicians, and then they have outside advisory committees looking at it as well. Um, and these are all people who are, you know, again, physicians and scientists, also members of the community. So they have a real interest in making sure that, that we're getting safe uh, treatments out available to people. So that process, I think we should feel really confident in. So one other piece with it being developed quickly, which is really different, typically something gets developed, it gets studied, it gets approved, and then somebody comes along to make it. Um, and that whole process takes time. What really changed this time was, you know, this Operation Warp Speed, which maybe didn't leave a good feeling in people's mouth with the, the, the name of it. Um, but it, you know, what it actually did was it was a huge investment on government part to say, let's start producing this vaccine. So the moment that it's approved, it's available. Um, and so that was, you know, pretty insightful and allowed us to, you know, get the approval and then roll the vaccine out right away. Um, and that was a, a risk that the government took on that, you know, private industry normally would not have. So I think those two pieces are kind of how it got out so quickly. And now we're at a point where we have hundreds of millions of people who have gotten the vaccine. And all, so there's a huge amount of uh, safety data on people that have already gotten the vaccine and that is continuing to be studied. So in a lot of ways, this is one of the best studied vaccines that we've ever had. Thank you, Dr. Francis, for that. And thank you for, for framing the conversation around um, our children. You know, I failed to note that the reason we queried the community is because we recognize by looking at the data for our county that we still have a substantial number of individuals between that 20 to 39 year group um, that is yet to get vaccinated. And we recognize that many of them are likely um, caretakers apologize the noise, caretakers or parents. Um, and so in preparation for uh, the pediatric vaccinations coming online, we wanna make sure that we're providing education and answering questions to the parents of our community who, who may be concerned for themselves and likely then translate that concern onto their children. So thank you, Dr. Francis, for, for framing that that way. Dr. Powell, Dr. Larson, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, I really think Dr. Francis, who um, I also work in collaboration with here in Watsonville um, as a pediatric hospitalist on the inpatient side. Um, one, I echo her comments, like it's just a pleasure to be here to have these conversations because it's very important to inform our community and kind of dis you know, spell some of the myths, but also just address some of the concerns that are really valid concerns addressed by parents and community members and caregivers of what's the best thing to do for your child. Um, and I look forward to uh, answering more questions during the course of this chat this morning. So Dr. Powell and Dr. Larson, let me pose a, a, a kind of a follow-up question to your point, Dr. Powell. And that is this idea that, um, for, for individuals to get the vaccines. And there could be some parents out there that are equally concerned about the long-term effects that this could have in their children and the, the potential health impacts that this could have on individuals that have the vaccine. As, as you saw in the slide, uh, there was some concern around um, fertility uh, being raised by the community, as well as this idea that we really don't know the long-term side effects. Would you like to speak to that, Dr. Powell, and then Dr. Light Larson, please weigh in as well. Yes, um, so that's a wonderful question, and we completely understand because we are like 
we talked about before uh, recently have developed these vaccines, but no vaccine, um, including COVID-19, is really um, a able to cause impotence or infertility really just with how it's developed. Um, it's really just to help boost our immune system to create antibodies towards these viruses and really kind of understanding that process is really important when you are receiving any vaccine is that's what it's ultimately trying to do. So it really um, wouldn't impact those things. Another thing just to also think about um, in my lens, I also work with a lot of uh, pregnant women uh, in the hospital who are delivering. And um, it's something where we strongly encourage um, women in pregnancy also to receive the vaccine. And this population has also been studied um, very carefully as well. Uh, during vaccine trials, over 20,000 women um, were uh, studied in this population and they saw very positive responses in terms of mothers um, having immunity and also benefits to uh, the fetus, the infant, um, with some of those antibodies uh, transferring during the breastfeeding process through breast milk. So we feel very confident with what has been done thus far in terms of uh, studying this vaccine, but we also know that there will be ongoing studies even as we continue to understand um, COVID-19 better. So just knowing that we are really trying to mitigate uh, the further spread and really the severe implications and impact that COVID-19 can have. So there's the other side of if you're unvaccinated, we have seen those effects and what that can happen to the mother and to her unborn child. And that can, you know, in, in the worst case scenario, lead to death. So, you know, you do have to think about the information that's available to you and also rate, weigh the risk and benefits. But really, we've seen nothing but benefits from this vaccine thus far, but we'll continue to learn and understand it better and really the long term um, um, course. Dr. Larson, any, any additional comments to that? And in particular, um, a, as a follow-up to, to this conversation, if you could speak to also um, this concept that if you've gotten COVID, uh, you don't really, you're immune, you don't really need the vaccine. Yes, thank you for having me here today. I'm really pleased to be here with everyone. And Dr. Francis and Dr. Powell have really well articulated everything. Um, and before I answer about if you've already had COVID, why would I then need a vaccine? If I can back up just and share a quick personal story that I hadn't intended to, but I thought if it helps and if there are any organizations where parents would like to discuss more, please feel free to share my phone number and I can talk to them. But I will as an individual go back to March <laughs> when this stall started. Uh, it's funny, I can even remember the year, 2020. And uh, I thought to myself, oh no, I don't want to be a guinea pig and get the vaccine because <laughs> they haven't studied it enough. So that was my initial place where I came from. And then I followed up and researched and realized, wow, this is incredible technology. The technology has actually been around for 20 years. I kind of was a little surprised we hadn't started sooner with this technology, the mRNA use of vaccines. I kind of am hoping moving forward, we have all vaccines like this, it's so safe to use. Uh, they didn't have one yet for COVID, but they've been working on mRNA technology for quite some time. And when I saw the results of how it can prevent death, because we have to understand that we don't know with COVID who is going to die and who's going to live, uh, I couldn't wait then to get my vaccine. So even I as a provider with all my scientific training had that initial gut reaction. Don't practice this on me, <laughs> I don't want it. And then, uh, but I just wanna make sure I had the conversations, I read up on it and it's a, I'm a, I have fully converted to where it's a safe vaccine. It helps protect my life. It helps pr I protect other people's lives by getting the vaccine. My kids have gotten the vaccine. And so I'm very grateful we're having this conversation because there is a lot of misinformation out there. And I really would like to debunk that and make sure people are reading both sides and understanding why they would move forward with the vaccine because parents love their children and they want to make sure that they're protected and thrive. And we want our society to return to whatever we can consider normal again. So having said that, 
it is true, you might think, well, if I had COVID, I have immunity, just like in the old days with chickenpox, you got chickenpox and you had immunity. But with COVID, we do not yet know how long that immunity lasts. Same with the vaccine, we're still not completely sure. We have some studies saying maybe about eight months for with vaccine or with disease. And then we also have the variants. And it is showing that the COVID vaccine can help protect against the variants. So it is really important to be able to get the vaccine and to get the booster and to understand, you know, it may not be a one-time dose. Maybe we're doing this every year like flu because the flu mutates every year. COVID is mutating. And so we want to be able to protect ourselves. Again, it's so challenging because some people have COVID with no symptoms but they can pass it on to someone else who will be then on a respirator and die in a few days, in like 10 days. So we just wanna, as human beings, really think about protecting ourselves, our loved ones and the community around us. So, but it's a very challenging topic. So I understand why people have their fears and concerns. And, you know, we wanna recognize that you have a choice in the end and just make sure you have all the information available um, to make the decision that's best for you and your family and your community. Thank you, Dr. Larson, and thank you for bringing up this conversation about the flu. We actually have a question from um, some uh, an audience member, and it's regarding um, uh, how the vaccine works with the flu. So how does the COVID vaccine work with the flu? Is it a good idea to get both? And specifically, um, is the flu shot an effective um, shot? Is it, is, it, is it effective? So who would like to take that on? Vaccine, COVID vaccine and flu shots. I think they're both very effective. Um, as we know, uh, the influenza vaccine is slightly different than the COVID-19 vaccine in terms of its creation, but both have the same purpose of creating antibodies and really boosting your own immune response. Um, the only variance that I would say with the influenza vaccine is that we track the different flu uh, strains each year. So it's more of a guess of deciding, you know, is this going to be the strain that we are tackling this year? And they are yearly developing a new flu vaccine. That being said, really the best option to protect yourself this winter season, especially as, you know, you're wanting to plan your holiday gatherings and being back with your loved ones is really getting both COVID-19 and the flu vaccine. Um, just kind of, as we already know, with the COVID-19 vaccine, it does take about two weeks for you to start to build that full immune response. So waiting that timeline. So I don't know if I would do both back to back, but I would definitely time it out and talking to your healthcare provider to um, kind of figure out the best timing to get both vaccines is going to be really important this season. Yes, both are very effective. Sometimes the flu is more effective than other seasons. Again, different technology creating it, a different virus. We know a lot about SARS or COVID and the, uh, I'd have to, I didn't prepare for that part, but I do know that there is more information on, and they were better able to replicate the antibodies you need to protect yourself from COVID-19, whereas influenza, because it's mutating and we're trying to guess. So some seasons we have better effectiveness with vaccines. And again, this conversation always goes back to Yes, it may not be 100% effective. Yes, you may still end up with the flu or with COVID, but would you have been hospitalized without the vaccine? Would you have died from the illness had you not had the vaccine? So, and maybe statistics say only 1%, 2% of people will die from this, but what if that's your loved one? What if that's your child? Then it's 100% for you. So. I prefer not to use statistics in that sense to see how prevalent death is because when it happens to a family, it's, it's everything. Uh, great. Um, there is, we're gonna move into the conversation about children. So since we're on this topic around the COVID vaccine and the flu shot, and I know that uh, the the study itself, um, there, there may be some information, but we don't yet have the full analysis of the study for, for the 5 to 11-year-old population. But there is a question regarding 
um, the children receiving both the COVID vaccine and the immunizations that we know children get um, uh, throughout their, their developing years. Any comments or questions about that? Is it safe? And in particular, can they receive it? Will they be able to receive the COVID vaccine as they're getting their other immunizations? I can go first. Thanks, Dr. Powell. Um, uh, so yes, you can receive COVID vaccine with other vaccines. And maybe some of you do remember in the beginning, there was some caution with that. And again, it goes back to where in the process of the emergency use authorization you were in, uh, which now I realize is a misnomer. At the time, I didn't quite understand the vocabulary behind that. But they had gone through phase one, phase two of clinical trials. But during phase three is when you have a larger group and in the community, and you're trying to still determine, can you use other modalities? Whereas if you don't do emergency use authorization, you would have gone through clinical phase three and you would have said, oh yeah, you can do vaccines, it's totally fine. But so there was a lot of caution in the beginning until we had more data. So initially COVID vaccine was by itself. And then as they continued to watch and monitor it, they realized, oh, there is no interaction. We're fine to move to clinical phase four. So emergency use authorization just meant Instead of waiting till phase three, which sometimes can take years, you start there. But they had already done one and two, which had a lot of good information, a lot of good safety information. Um, they were just being super cautious. So we can do both now. It's not a problem. And also to that point uh, that you brought up um, about other vaccines. So something that's been actually um, really concerning is during this time that we have seen delays in our other routine vaccines uh, during COVID. And I think it's more so just the uh, a little bit more fragmentation with doing um, more virtual visits compared to in-person, but as we've been able to do more in-person uh, wellness visits and checks, we have seen that delay and that's even more concerning because those are also serious viral and bacterial infections that you know we've mostly eradicated and really don't wanna see those kind of come back in our population or our community. So really just making sure that in addition to receiving a uh, COVID-19 vaccine, that you're also making sure your child is caught up on the routine uh, vaccines that they should be receiving uh, during this very kind of like critical developmental period as well in terms of their own immune system. So really making sure you're scheduling those appointments, getting those catch-up vaccines. Um, it's been great to see what our county has done in terms of really kind of upping their clinic visits to really kind of accommodate those needs for our community uh, so children are caught up on their vaccines. Oh, thank you for lifting that up. That's something that all of us who work in different, our different agencies can, can do at the agency level. And that is impart that education uh, to the families and the children that we, uh, all the families that we work with, so important. Um, let me dive in a little bit more to this, this um, these concerns around children in particular. So we know we've been hearing um, about the myocarditis um, and, and, and for those of you who maybe have heard the word but don't quite understand what it means, it's really this um, uh, heart-related problems for uh, uh, individuals, young athletes in particular, I think is how our media has been really discussing it. Those who receive the COVID vaccine um, who then have instances of myocarditis. So is there a correlation? Is there a link? Dr. Larson, Dr. Powell, and I think uh, Dr. Francis had a step off, but I'll rely on the two of you. And Eric, can I jump in for just a second? Yes. Maybe after we hear um, some response to that question, I know we have a couple questions about the school aspect. Maybe we can move on jump. to those. Yeah. Yes, we will yeah. be jumping into that now. Yes, thank you. I can quickly answer uh, that. So right now they're seeing it's a very rare condition. So myocarditis is just 
inflammation around kind of the muscle of the heart uh, that can lead to some chest pain and abnormal heart rhythms. It is very rare. I think it was only five cases that they saw in all of the children when they're 12 and older who um, had this um, uh, complication. Um, but in terms of if you think about being infected by COVID itself, the virus, it's 37 times more likely that you'll develop uh, the myocarditis compared to the vaccine alone. And the fact that it was only five and they saw them in adolescent teen males, um, maybe also spoke to maybe underlying uh, uh, um, cardiac disorders that the children had themselves. And so really just thinking about that complication is so rare, so rare and so minimal, um, whereas um, having, you know, actually exposure to COVID-19 is more of a clearer link. I think the benefit of receiving the vaccine outweighs that very small risk. Um, and then something also that I think about, like in general, as a pediatrician, um, our body is very wonderful in terms of how it responds to um, new, you know, pathogens and for children, you know, how they're able to, you know, fight off infections. But I always think of um, immunocompromised children in particular uh, when it comes to COVID-19 and other infections and really making sure we're protecting that population as well. So as you're talking to your family, as you're understanding, getting more education, it's also about protecting those children as well. And I think your child receiving that COVID-19 vaccine is also helping those those children who have um, more um, higher risk of having more poor outcomes. So just thinking about that from the public health standpoint too. Yeah, I agree with what Dr. Powell said. And from that study, um, if parents are concerned, the myocarditis often occurred within four days of receiving the vaccine. So, you know, keep, let's keep an eye on your children afterwards, but it's very rare you're more likely to get myocarditis from the COVID disease itself. And like that study had said, 37 times more likely than children who did not have COVID. So, uh, you know, one, yeah, it, it's just the numbers are staggering from the disease versus the vaccine itself. So just keep that in mind. Thank you both. And I know we're all very eager to understand how we're preparing, um, how our schools are preparing for uh, the distribution of vaccines when that becomes available for our, our five to 11 year olds. So Jennifer, would you like to give us an overview of what um, the County Office of Ed is doing in partnership with other districts to keep, be prepared? And how exactly will children, particularly students, uh, be receiving uh, the vaccine or have access to it? Yeah, thank you. We are so excited and can't wait. Uh, wish, we wish that we had that date. Um, but we will be ready as soon as as, as soon as we get it. Um, I think that that we've all heard we're we're hoping and crossing our fingers for perhaps the uh, full approval or I'm sorry the emergency use authorization for ages uh, five to eleven, uh, perhaps the last week of October. And um, so we would be ready um, tentative, tentatively November first. And um, we have plans and are all ready to go. Um, and we see really we see schools as a really important part. Of, um, of this rollout. Uh, it's a real key setting, um, especially for our families. Um, we will have uh, clinics at the elementary schools. We've partnered with the elementary schools, but also with the Inspire Diagnostics and with our um, county health services. Um, and we'll get a lot of support from our partners, um, our local pediatricians and, um, and other providers. Um, because we really want to encourage families to come um, to our school-based uh, sites and receive information and receive if they have questions about the vaccine. Um, they can come when they're picking up their child, um, weekends. It might also be a place where they can get information about some of the other healthcare needs that maybe they weren't able to address during the pandemic. Um, like we said, perhaps past due on these immunizations. Um, so if, if parents have any questions, we feel like it will be a really great place um, for them to, be, to feel secure and confident in their decision. Um, so we will, we'll have um, school-based clinics um, at our elementary schools, and um, we'll also have drive-through locations if that is not an option for our working families, um, uh, weekends and, um, and other more convenient times too. Um, school location clinics can also happen on the weekend as well. Um, but one of the 
one thing that we saw with our older kids when they were getting vaccinated at our school sites or when they've been um, getting tested at our, at our school sites, families might be more um, comfortable um, giving consent and signing a, an authorization for consent and sending their kiddos, um, older kiddos, to go and do it on their own. Um, but we're aware that our younger kids, families and parents and guardians, they might want to come with them. So we'll make sure that that is an option too. Um, there was a question earlier about consent. And so that can be done um, in advance if they would like to do that. Um, they can do it electronically or they can send it in writing if they're not able um, or feeling like they're needing to be present. Because there will, consent will be, that's been another question, consent will be required, um, but, but uh, it won't be necessary for families to be present. Jennifer, and as a follow-up to that, um, the County Office of, of Ed is working with the multiple school districts throughout the county. Can you speak a little bit about that level of coordination that's happening? Yeah, all of our uh, school districts in the county, um, as well as our private schools. Um, so all of our school districts in the county, as soon as we have authorization, um, they will uh, identify which elementary schools they, that they would like to have um, host the clinic. And then we will send our teams out immediately. And, and information will be sent to families. I know it's, there's a big question of when and when is it our, when is it our turn? Um, as soon as we know, um, we have all the information ready to go. So uh, each individual school will directly communicate with families, um, but then also the school districts um, will through their office and through their websites, um, Santa Cruz Office of Education, we will issue a press release. There will be something in the Sentinel. We'll put it out on social media, um, Facebook and Instagram, but our other partners will help uh, communicate that as well. Santa Cruz County Health Services and uh, PBPSA and Salud, um, all of our partners will be uh, sharing that information because we want to make sure that, uh, that it's accessible to everyone in terms of, um, you know, if they can't get to their own school, they can go to another school. Um, and if they can't get to those, they can come to the drive throughs Jennifer, there's a question. I know the questions are starting to come in, um, but let me get this, this latter question that was just asked. Will there be a hotline or a particular telephone number that parents can call if they have questions? There will. On our um, Santa Cruz County Office of Education, we, on our website, we have a COVID um, website, and there will be information there with, a, with a, a, an email if they have questions or a phone number as well. And then we will definitely have all of the information uh, with questions and answers. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to get all of that information for, for families um, so they can feel well-informed and prepared, but absolutely they can give us a call um, so we can let them know over the phone too. What about um, school-based testing, Jennifer? So we recognize that um, for some folks as Dr. Larson, um, acknowledge in her own story. It might take a little bit of research and inquiring, uh, but there may be uh, a need to be testing uh, students. So can you talk a little bit about the, the plan for testing at our schools? Yeah, for our for COVID testing, we are doing um, testing right now at all of our schools. Um, that is optional. Um, uh, testing is, is always optional, um, but it is offered at all of our schools right now, and we will continue to focus on that. Um, testing will continue to be a big component um, to be able to keep kids in school safely as we feel that a vaccine will be a big component to being able to keep our kids in school um, uh, this whole year in person safely. Um, and so right now we do have testing. Um, we can, uh, students, it is free and students all ages um, in childcare, um, kindergarten, all through high school. They can participate in surveillance testing if they would like. Um, parents can sign them up for that. And again, that is voluntary. voluntary. Um, and they can do that right now, twice a week if they would want. And that's just to monitor um, and, and check to make sure that they aren't carrying um, at COVID and just not being symptomatic. Um, but then also by chance, if there is a potential exposure, if we become aware that there's a positive case in the school, um, we quickly will isolate um, that, the, the youngster and that student is at home for their required 10 days. 
And then um, those that maybe had been exposed to them, we're offering ongoing testing twice a week to them so that they can remain um, in school in person. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, can you speak a little bit about the uh, vaccine mandate that the governor announced a few weeks ago for all students? And when would that take effect? Or how is that to be implemented? Yeah, and as we know right now, um, we do have a list of uh, vaccinations that are required um, for kids to attend school in person, such as uh, measles and mumps and rubella. And so what our governor did, he announced that uh, as soon as the COVID vaccine is granted full approval, um, they plan to add uh, COVID to the list of those required vaccines. And um, they will be required um, to be vaccinated for COVID um, in, if they want to participate in person, just like the others um, that are required. Um, and it will take place the following term um, that, the, that, the, that the, we get approval for their grade span. Um, so we anticipate first that those uh, students um, ages 12 and over, that they will be granted full approval first. And so that would be grades uh, 7 through 12. And as soon as that is granted, um, the following grade span, um, uh, the following uh, term, uh, they would be required. So um, the terms are defined by the California Department of Public Health as January 1st, which would be commonly referred to as spring, or July 1st, um, which would be summer or, um, or fall for us. So estimates are right now um, from the California Department of Public Health that right now the requirement uh, would be expected to apply to grades 7 through 12 first, and it's anticipated that that would start um, July 1st of 2022. So that would look like um, our middle school, high school kids being required next fall to be vaccinated, that those would be the, the first group. And then later, um, after next fall, um, our younger group would be next. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for all that great information. I see there's a question uh, regarding how we in Santa Cruz County have been doing with vaccination rates. And I know that we have plenty of partners from the county um, that maybe can, can chime in here, or at least in the chat box. But I do want to point to the santacruzhealth.org website, which I believe Nicole already included in the chat. There's a beautiful image there that gives the progress of how we're doing countywide on our vaccination rate. And as I look at the vaccine demographic, um, let me see, the vaccine administration page, it looks like to date we have 194,070 people uh, received at least one vaccination dose. There it is. Thank you, Nicole, for putting that on there. That equates to 71% um, 71 of our of, of the total county population. And then fully vaccinated, meaning they've received the full dosage, we're at 65%. Um, so that's how we're doing. And I would really encourage uh, all of us to make uh, this a marker on our on our uh, internet. I look at it on a very regular basis and I do know that the county does update this on a regular basis as well. So thank you yeah, for asking if that. If I could just add one, one more thing about how excited I am about um, the, the vaccine being available. Um, of course, our goal is in-person learning um, for all of our kids. And we are going to be able to do this with uh, individuals being vaccinated. Right now, we are so proud of uh, the amount, uh, how well we are doing with uh, our eligible students being vaccinated. Because when they are vaccinated, they don't have to quarantine if they're exposed. And um, they can continue to attend school in person. And it's important that they still be tested to make sure that, uh, that, that they don't get COVID and perhaps spread it to those that are not vaccinated. And so we'll continue to offer that testing. But if you are vaccinated, you don't have to quarantine and, and they can keep coming to school. And so we've seen that in our middle school population and our high school population. It has, uh, it's been just outstanding. We've been able to see it um, happen safely with all the testing that we are doing. 
um, school transmission is extremely rare. Um, so we're seeing that it can be done safely um, for our younger kids that aren't eligible to vaccinate um, yet. Unfortunately, they're more likely to have to quarantine and stay home. Um, so we really look forward to them being eligible for a vaccine so that we can keep them in school, in person. Consistent. Yes, thank you, Jennifer, for bringing that up because I'd like to add developmentally, it's really important for kids of all ages to be at school. They learn social and academic and emotional competencies there. And it's really important for their thrival, to, for them to thrive. I've been very concerned with the closure of schools. Is this going to be a lost generation? How do we help them catch up? with the emotional learning, the social cues, the academics, and the schools really have done an incredible job with masking to reduce transmission, with setting up the Inspire Diagnostics to do PCR testing. I'm embarrassed to say they're faster than we are at the clinic, <laughs> better, easier access. It was fantastic that they could allow for 24 hour turnaround to do a quick swab and get the kid back into school because Dr. Sabah and Jennifer Busing understood the best place for the kids is to be in school and not home alone on a computer, um, trying to learn uh, in a very isolated environment. So I just wanna give a kudos and congratulations again to um, the team that Jen works with, uh, how much they have provided our community and how we as a clinic rely on them to try and get kids back into school sooner. We are so over impacted with so many other medical conditions and concerns. So thank you, uh, Jennifer, for all the wonderful work you've done this last year. It's been a lot, <laughs> long hours and a lot of protests and you've done an incredible job. So thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, no, thank you, Dr. Lesson. You bring up such a great point. I'm also a mom and I have two kids and and I, I see firsthand the importance of our children being in school. And all of our schools, of course, are focused on the academic piece because there was an academic loss. Um, but more importantly, most importantly right now is kids being in school with each other and with support groups. And it's the, the mental health component, the social emotional piece of processing what has happened and what is happening and um, there's other milestones that they need that they need to hit hit and reach. But um, just being in school in person um, is so important therapeutically um, at this point. And so, of course, like I said, I'm not discounting the importance of the academic piece, but their health, their physical health, and their mental health and their social well-being um, is it's just crucial that they stay in school. I know it's really difficult for for parents, of course, firsthand to. Um, to have to do the uh, symptom screening each day and to keep your kids home if they have a runny nose um, and all of the testing and masking. And there's, there's so much more um, to, ov to overcome, so many hurdles. Um, but our kids are doing a really great job with it. And um, they can follow direction. And when they're given structure, they're do they can do so well. Um, but it is worth it. It is worth it. And we're going to keep, we're gonna keep advocating um, for, for vaccine. We're, we see that it can work and they can be in school uh, without, without a, a lot of transmission. It, 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 it is being done safe, following all the guidance from the California Department of Public Health that they give for schools. I just wanna take a moment to thank all of you for being here today and sharing uh, so much useful, valuable, accurate information in this short amount of time. I, I learned a lot of new things and I, I feel like I've been <laughs> doing a lot to try to keep up with uh, all the new information coming out. So this was really helpful. Um, we are getting to the end of our time today. I'm going to launch our usual poll, if I can get my meeting controls to show, um, to ask for your feedback about today's session. And while we're doing that, Dr. Powell, do you wanna say a few words about the Black Health Matters initiative and the event that's yes, coming up? Um, so uh, this is a wonderful event that's taking place this Saturday. Um, and many of our nonprofits and community groups here in Santa Cruz will be present, but there'll be a vaccine pop-up and similar to this, 
just more of an in-person conversation to answer questions related to the COVID vaccine. But Erica, I will say the first kind of list of questions, the ones that really got to me with a comment is the idea of this generational trauma, uh, this fear of trust or lack of trust in our medical profession and the government. And, you know, as an African-American woman first, um, I understand this uh, complexity and particularly during this time with what took place with the pandemic and all of the social and um, uh, just kind of racial unrest that was taking place. But I really am encouraged to this and also making sure we're putting health equity at the forefront. Um, and then also to the point of just, you know, Dr. Larson and also um, hearing what Jim Busey was saying about getting our kids back into school. This is also an equity piece because uh, we don't want our black and brown and indigenous children behind because they aren't receiving uh, their vaccines or in any ways be at a further disparity. Uh, so really just trying to understand like where is the concern, the fear, really where that's coming from. I've had a lot of hard conversations with my own family members about the vaccines and what does that mean and are we being tested? So come to this event if you have more questions, encourage other uh, um, people that you know. This should be also a celebration of the work of the Black Health Matters Initiative. Um, but just thank you for this time and really having these conversations is what was really going to help to um, resolve those disparities that we see in health. Thank you, Dr. Powell, for the reminder. And last but not least, we have more events coming up in October and 